So welcome everyone to the community call. We skipped it two weeks ago, so uh, hope that was fine. And we'll try to catch up if there was anything uh, on the agenda. It's pretty lightweight. Nevertheless, we have uh, the usual updates. And uh, then we're going to talk a bit about what extensions that there's some uh, potential misbehavior that they open up. So there's some pitfalls there that uh, we're going to go through. This is probably going to be the bulk of the discussion today. Uh, and then we want to mention two things that are in the works. Uh, we're looking into V039 and what we're going to start including there. And in particular, there's proto changes that will be coming up and we want to open up the discussions so that we signal it. Uh, that could be involved in breaking changes, so it's important to, to, to signal it ahead of time. And then the data companion API, we spoke about this roughly a month ago. And we have some design that we want to uh, gather feedback on. And uh, yeah, if there's other topics, please uh, let me know. And I can then write a way so that we can also allocate time throughout the call. Um, I think if there's time, yeah. uh, Adi, it also might be nice to talk about load extension load testing and what the plans are there. Um, and then- Is this for performance or just in general? Yeah, performance. I, I think there's a few potential uh, performance implications for load extensions. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then uh -huh. a separate thing, which is maybe more minor, is just there was some probably undesirable Penderman behavior that we saw yesterday during the neutron upgrade that Bane was also uh, very, very close to, which um is maybe good to just talk about yeah. and think about whether there are things we can do to improve it longer term specifically like the um the connection between tendermint and the and a remote signing i think it was was the source of some yeah. so that's a little thing this is a pre-val connection yeah got it that's actually on our on our plate uh but uh, it's good to go back into it. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning those very interesting. Okay, then we're going to try to speed it up to be effective and cover everything. Uh, then should we just mention a few things? You want to kick off the updates? Really quickly. Sure. So um, we want to start our QA process for the O38 release, but what will be blocking that is actually the, the outcome of the discussion over here around vote extensions. So if there were things that we need to change in the interface for vote extensions to try to mitigate some of these potential cases of misbehavior, then it may, well, it will delay our, our QA process by maybe a couple of days, maybe a week or so, depending on the, the nature of the changes we'd have to implement. But then once we've solidified the interface for vote extensions, then we'll start our QA, more extensive QA process. Um, and then subsequently, so, so what we'll do is to signal that we're starting our QA process, we'll cut 0380RC0 or RC1, depending on um, what we decide over there. And then we'll, we'll run our QA process. It may take at least a week or two to, to do that, um, incorporating, you know, potentially making changes and so on. And then once that's done, then we'll look at cutting the final 0380 release. So um, that's the... Uh, sort of major update. Um, I, I don't know what you wanted to talk about over here with regard to the debug kill command. I uh, just wanted to re uh, restate it that we found something that was undesirable there, uh, specifically to the PID. And uh, they posted the question on Slack. We were looking whether there's actual people using it, whether operators or, or developers are making use of this command. Interestingly, this morning I made I, I tried to make use of it uh, and didn't really prove useful in in the in our specific case uh, for debugging. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to raise that again in case no one is using it. We might be looking into deprecating it in the future, but not necessarily. Cool. And then we wanted to talk about the knowledge base repo quick. The uh, um, so the what we want to do over there is we want to start to try and capture very rough notes on a bunch of different concepts and ideas. It's mostly just to make uh, some of our teams thinking public, as, as public as we can with, uh, you know, um, 
trying to think of how to I don't know, articulate that. Um, yeah, we want to start to build up a bit of a knowledge graph uh, and we'll start capturing some of our thinking around the consensus algorithms, like the, the protocols and things we're looking into. Um, it's still very much in its early stages of development as a knowledge base. I wouldn't rely on it yet anytime soon. I think that probably over time, we're going to look at, at building it up to fleshing it out to be uh, more comprehensive. And what we're hoping to do over there is to try and preserve some of our knowledge and understanding for posterity. And also maybe it'll be beneficial to the, the rest of the ecosystem. We're also, also hoping that this is going to help with uh, disseminating some of our uh, thinking while we're doing research oriented work as well. Because while we're doing engineering work, we're also looking into specifying, like writing specifications and potentially also doing some more deeper research all the time. We'd like somewhere to be able to capture some artifacts from, from that process. All right, yeah, that was most of uh, just signaling out and uh, letting everyone know about it. Uh, unless there's anything, we can go into the main dish of today, the vault extensions. Uh, Lazare, you wanna kick it off? Sure. Yeah, so, so this part here, it was raised because of something that I think Alex, Alex under this posted on, uh, on Slack. And then um, Sergio and I started discussing it, to see if there could be other cases, uh, um, ways for, for um, presenting those to misbehavior, misbehaving with respect to, to both extensions. So we came up with this uh, four cases. Um, uh, Case C is the one that was actually raised by, by this, and D is a special case of C. Um, but uh, let me go over them one by one. Right? The first one um, in which a node, knowing that's going to be the proposal for the next height, tries to choose the best extensions from a pool of extensions that it got on the previous height. Let's say that it has gotten more than it actually needed, for the commit, so it can actually choose the ones it finds that are more, more useful for, for that proposal. Right? Um, and we thought about it, but we see no way of preventing uh, this case. So it's not really uh, uh, censorship because it, you, the node cannot just throw away extensions, right? It has to use extensions that were created by uh, the, the, that were in the commit votes, the pre-commit votes from the previous height, but if it has gotten more pre-commit votes than it needed, then it can choose the ones that are more useful. Right? So I don't, we don't see a way of preventing it from happening. And uh, the, why we don't see is because that behavior, that choice of pre-commit, it could have happened naturally by just by the virtue of the node being asynchronous, so the, the if the message had been received on a different orders on a different order, then that choice of um, both extensions would have been made without any misbehavior. So we don't see it as well. It could be maybe categorized by the application as as a as a misbehavior, but there's no way of going going around it. At least we don't see any. Um, is the case clear? Yeah. And why? Uh, yeah. yeah, the case is clear to me. Okay. Um, so the second case is uh, we were asking: Can a node use uh, pick and choose the extensions that are valid, uh, but are not latest ones seen on the previous height, right? So let's say that uh, the, C, the node starts and it has two sets of, uh, of pre-commits with different sets of uh, extension because the extensions might have changed during the execution of, of the previous height. Right? In order to propose, the node will have to choose extensions from a uh, round that decided. So even though if the decision happened on two different rounds, then yes, the node could choose potentially different extensions, but only from those two different rounds in which there were enough pre-commits to decide. So in that case, 
the the, the extensions are valid. So it can it's, it's like the first case, it can choose the ones that are more beneficial for that node, but they still have to be valid. And uh, there's no way of going around that again because by just by virtue of how the network might have delivered those messages, that set of uh, of foot extensions would have been chosen anyway. Okay, so these are just uh, red herrings, right? Uh, the one that uh, that Bess raised is more interesting. Let's say that. Um, oh, sorry, not to derail. Yes. Could we double click on the second one a little bit? Um, there, you said that. So the first one it makes total sense to me, like why we can't get around this. Like you're sort of at a fundamental liveness trade off. Um, but for the, the second one, um, being able to use um, vote extensions from a previous round, that feels like in theory, you could prevent that potentially, either at the tenement layer or the application layer or both. Um, if, uh, forgive me, because I don't know exactly what the block header includes, but I, in a world where you know the proposal at h plus one uh, has to indicate in the header like the the round at which the block h was proposed, we we shouldn't be able to know looking at that proposal. Um, we should be able to know just like okay, which which round actually was consensus on in, in the previous round and for, and for the previous height and if the vote extensions are tagged with like the round mm -hmm. where the vote was created, then we should be able to look at the vote extensions that are then included in the proposal and say, actually, no, you've included this one from the wrong round. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I can throw this one. So that feels potentially possible to solve. Yeah, Am yeah. I thinking about this the wrong one? No, no, you're not thinking. Maybe, maybe I misexpressed um, myself. Um, so both vote extensions will have to match the, the vote extensions will have to match the round in which the decision has happened but it, and from in the previous height. But different nodes could have seen the decision in different rounds, right? So, the, so depending on the node, the, on the round in which it has seen the decision, it will choose different uh, pre-commit votes and uh, vote extensions. But those, pre those extensions have to match the round in which the decision was seen. And which will match the canonicalized um, round, the canonicalized, canonicalized commit for the next uh, height. So yeah, you're right. The the, the extensions have to match, uh, but they different those may have seen different uh, decisions. Different, not different decisions. Decisions on different rounds. Does that uh, address your point? I think so. Yeah. So uh, either way, the the extensions are valid for that round, and uh, the proposal will be made with a set of uh, valid extensions that match a round in which the decision was reached. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Um, okay. Any another question on the, those? Okay. I want to just quickly clarify what I mean when I vote potential for censorship here. Uh, mm -hmm. If there is a proposer, say I am the proposer in height one, round zero, uh, I could censure vote extensions because I could just choose that I never include the vote extensions from uh, whatever Dokia capital validated, right? If you have a, a other other you have more than yes. needed then you can yes actually you can you can censor in that sense yeah. that sense yeah and i could do that for every time that i am a proposal like i could just choose that i don't like docia capital and i could always yeah. not include it yeah true another and way that, to frame this mm -hmm. is like you could uh, you could a proposer could censor up to a third of vote extensions every time it's a proposer yeah up to that yeah up to a third, that's correct. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's okay. Um, however, uh, however, um, 
an application, uh, I'm just spitballing here, I, um, but an application could in theory require more, more stringent requirements such that in the process proposal, if let's say um, you want slightly more stricter censorship guarantees, you could say, well, hey, I'm not going to accept a proposal that has no, uh, no less than two thirds plus some plus some additional um, amount, right? So maybe not the full 100%, but also not two thirds. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you could, you could in theory, uh, worst case scenario, in theory, a proposer could censor up to one third. Sure, but that would be more, require more messages to be delivered than the, the commit, the, the consensus protocol actually yes. requires. Yes, so, that's correct, yeah. yeah. This so it, you, you, may, you may be wasting some rounds, some, some decisions because of that, right? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yes, the application would be free to adapt. Yeah. Okay, so with respect to the third case, let's say that a node proposed uh, extended the vote with some uh, extension. And then it's the proposer of the next height, the first round of the next height. At that point, the node might just swap the, the extension that it had sent on the previous height into this new height. That's the case that uh, Bess uh, raised. And uh, yes, we don't see a way around that because that node has the ability to, to resign that same uh, extension as it had done on the previous round, right? Um, and uh, as, as a proposer, it, it is able to choose that, that message and just stick it in there. And the uh, other nodes will not, there's no way of forcing the node not to, to do that. What we could do is if any node sees divergent vote extensions signed for the same height and round and, um, and validator, they could use that as a proof of misbehavior. So we cannot force it to vote to, to use the right extension, but we could penalize it for doing so. How do you penalize it? Uh, you can use that as a, an evidence of misbehavior, and, but that's it. who is going to handle that is the application. The application to have to, some node would have to keep the extensions that it has seen on the previous height, and in seeing extensions, yeah. uh, a, a conflict extension, uh, it's an equivocation attack, Put that sent to the application. The application will have to penalize the node. Yeah, this gets tricky because one, it requires the application to keep track of vote extensions it saw uh, during verify vote extension, mm -hmm. um, and two, it would require it yeah to keep track of, of that and then also set, somehow propagate and handle misbehavior. Um, and then like, you know, how do you deal with the case where like a node, let's say some proposer P maliciously swapped its vote extension mm -hmm. and then some other validator uh, never saw that vote extension in, in the previous height, right? And verify vote extension. It wouldn't know that, hey, this proposer modified it, but it might, but other, other validators might, right? So how do you like, like, one is like, how do you even aggregate or create this this uh, evidence of misbehavior? And secondly, how do you propagate it uh, in in a in a like safe in a safe way? Um, I think that would require some some you know some thinking. Um, you, I think you would have to like change the protocol. Uh, yeah. So so like you know, to me, all of this stems from the fact that the proposer has first access to the vote extensions. If there was a way that, and we kind of brought this up in previous discussions, but if there was a way for all validators to get the vote extensions uh, without having to rely on the proposer, you know, C and D go away. Um, and even, I think all of these cases go away actually. Uh you could insert the dot extensions in the decision itself, but that would delay 
the use of it by one height more, right? The thing is, yeah. right now yeah. the, the extensions they are not part of the of the block. Right. Yes. You'd, you'd have to canonicalize the extensions for that to be uh, deterministic, right? But then you can only do that. You collect the extensions on one height. You can analyze it on the next one, and then they could be used on the third one. Can Can you remind me again right. why we we can't include them in process proposal request process proposal? Is it is it solely bandwidth concerns? No, they, they because they happen during the execution of the protocol, right? Uh, it, they are aggregated after the proposal. They are not part of the proposal itself. Um, so, so a quick question: um, Could we? Could we include like uh, so the vote extensions for that will be included in H plus one are part of the votes in H, um, and so could we like in the latter, like we do in finalized block include like the votes of um, of validators, and in this sense we could potentially include the vote extensions. I mean, this is kind of like what Bez was kind of saying that it's like oh now we have to keep track of it, but I think this is kind of like the um, best case solution because like in an optimal scenario like all validators will see two-thirds plus of the votes being passed around the network meaning that the the comment will have two-thirds plus of a um a what, what do you guys call it a uh, not a decided last commit but they like pre-decided last commit um a non a non-canonicalized non um yeah. um commit and so it's like at least in this scenario it's like okay the valve like the, the state machine has h plus one vote extensions at the end of h and then h plus one um when the proposal proposes the block and in process proposal like we could include the vote extensions there and then just like okay if two-thirds um if one-third plus of the if one-third yeah, one third plus of the vote extensions differ from the ones that they saw in their non canonicalized commit, then they could like say like okay there's something going on here because we saw two thirds plus of the commit that's because we like the block was finalized. And so, um, and so there is like some something going on with the with these vote extensions and either like that validator or full node or whoever witnessed it submits like proof of it and then it would go to the other nodes and the only thing here is like um i think like the application would have to keep knowledge of vote extensions for longer than one height because it would take potentially like two plus heights for evidence to propagate across the network so it could take up to the unbonding window let's say in the worst in worst worst case scenario to propagate the evidence around the network Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I didn't quite 100% follow you there, Marco, but I think we're, you know, I think in the context of, all right, this is what we have to work with, and we want to be able to effectively handle these cases, there's unfortunately no choice other than for the application to keep track of vote extensions uh, that it saw on previous, uh, previous heights and rounds. The question is a bit hazy in terms of like how to handle misbehavior, how to propagate it, how to verify it. Um, I don't know if the comment like have, has the comment team thought of ways around this other than forcing the application to keep track. Well, I, I think that I think the application is going to be the only one aware if. Um, if there's a discrepancy because the data within the vote extension is only known to the application, it's not known to comment. And so it would have to be like, uh, there's no way around from the application keeping knowledge um, of this. The only um, question is um, there, it's like well, kind of how to handle evidence. I mean, like, well, then comment, the can, votes... comment can say like we keep we keep vote extensions around for as long as the um, evidence duration. Um, that's like one way, and then like 
but then there needs to be like a new API for the application to like ask for that well, data. But, and so it's just kind of like that's easier. For that's the not entirely. To keep it. It's not. Yeah, it's sorry. not entirely. Yeah, it's not entirely true that tenor com comment doesn't know. Like vote extensions are just opaque bytes. I mean, yes, the mm -hmm. application knows how to interpret it. Uh, them, but they, it is just opaque bytes. So like, you know, like what if, what if, for example, what if in theory, what if in theory, like each proposer uh, includes uh, the vote extensions uh, that it got in, in response pro uh, process proposal, then comment would know like, hey, these are the vote extensions that I sent to the proposer and process and prepare but I got actually a different set in process. And so comment at that point would know that uh, the opaque bytes are actually different. Yes, uh, and Marco, so, uh, is it okay if we time box this to three yeah. max five minutes yeah. so that we can make sure we cover because otherwise we're going into protocol design and it takes sure. vote extensions are designed so that we don't, we didn't change the block, uh, the block uh, structure and by design, they are meant not to be captured inside the block, so they're kind of off band and they offer weaker guarantees than consensus. So it's not the same agreement, uh, strong agreement guarantees as consensus. So you cannot have them until five plus one. Uh, with that caveat in mind, you cannot have the same guarantees as you have what you put in a block. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, the, the other point is that uh, we already give the application a way of of handling the misbehavior, right? So the the, the nodes can uh, uh, remove validators from the set, right? If they they think that they they, mis they misbehave, they can uh, like uh, in the example that uh, Sergio built to use extensions, right? You could also pass evidence of misbehavior to the application and let the application decide what to do with that, and for example, uh, remove a node from the validator set. For somewhat different perspective, it, it, it feels like there's kind of two issues here. Um, one is what are the what are the kind of ways that nodes can misbehave, um, and is there anything we can do to change the interface that would address those uh, the, those problems of misbehavior? And then there is a second question of should the interface uh, should should we have a different interface? because it is easier for the application to to attempt to do these things um okay. and so on the, on the first one i would say probably just listening to marco you and you and Bez go back and forth it actually kind of sounds like even if we made any of those changes all of these attacks are still possible um and so like for example if i have you know a, a non-canonicalized commit at uh h in finalized block and I can keep track of that. And then I can look to see um, that uh, in the next proposal, more than one third are different. That is pretty much equivalent to just having in process proposal, having that validator um, confirm by putting the vote extensions in the proposal that um, two thirds are valid. So, so like the attack still exists, I can still manipulate up to one third. Right? So I, I don't think we're, I don't think by changing the interface in all of these ways, we get better. Um, but we maybe make it easier to detect the actual problems, if that makes sense. So the, the attacks don't go away, but maybe they're, they're harder to execute. And it does feel like one meta question, which I, I don't know if we should address here, is um, should there be an easier way for the application to say, hey, I, I care that every proposal has greater than two thirds valid vote extensions. Um, so just like to, to speak sort of how we're using them today, there's two major use cases. One is in MEV where we're trying to run censorship resistant auctions. And one is oracles, right? Where we wanna have censorship resistant oracles. Um, and in both of those cases, we need logic in process proposal that confirms more than two thirds of validator. Like this proposal includes you know, Oracle updates or MEV bids from two thirds plus validators and that they're valid and that this pr proposer has done an aggregation correctly. So in, in the vote, in the Oracle case, we wanna see that they've correctly done a median, right? 
Um, in the MEV case, we want to make sure that they've correctly selected the max of the bids that have been included. We can't guarantee they haven't censored anything because we have this limit uh, that we can't, I mean, we don't know that um, more than two thirds were available. But those, that's like fundamentally how we use them. But right now there's this awkwardness in the API, um, which is our block doesn't have access to those by default. So we just force the proposer to inject them in the proposal and in process proposal, we reject the proposal if they don't do that. Um, but that, that is all up to the application right now and it feels a little hacky, but it does work. Uh, <laughs> and so I think like, at least to give Skip's perspective on this, like there, there are various ways you can subvert vote extensions right now. The ones that are catchable, we can catch with some you know, process proposal work that we do on our side, uh, but there is work to do on our side. So it's like, for, for us, like, we just want to get vote extensions out there. So we're kind of like, let's push these API questions to the future because we think that with this process of just injecting vote extensions ourselves, we can do as good as possible. Um, and maybe some of that work could be pushed to tendermint, but we can do it. Uh, and, you know, we're just trying to get it out there for people to start yeah. using in applications. Um, I have a question for Barry. Um, do you have any, uh, like, if you had to think about concrete, uh, like specific things that you would change the interface to be able to make it more elegant, what would those changes look like for you at this point? Um, Simplest possible way of uh, making it more elegant to use. Yeah. So there's, in my mind, there's maybe two things, but again, I would, I say this all under the <laughs> the expectation that I would rather we not make these changes now and that we, we ship the first version. Um, but the thing that feels least elegant right now is we are basically always doing some kind of aggregation to, to, to make a state change. And we almost always are doing that aggregation in an adversarial setting where the proposer could very easily have an incentive to try to undermine it. Um, so, in our settings, we always need to manually inject vote extensions into the proposal, um, even though they're not included in the block by default. We have to do that because, like, we can't just just trust the proposer to be like, I, you know, I picked the max MEV bid, I promised, um, or I took the median of all of these oracles, and yeah, it was zero. Like, sorry guys. Um, like, so we we actually need we need the votes. Um, the vote extension data. I you one way you could do this, as Marco was suggesting, is um, maybe you you include them in finalized block, and the application can track them. I think because it's not canonical there, if you track them, you maybe invite problems. I would suggest that uh, if it was possible to have the setting where I could say, actually, I want my blocks to include vote extensions. Um, and I don't need to manually inject them like in transactions, which is what we're doing now. And I could just pull the vote extensions that the proposer has included in the block off of the block in process proposal. That would be much cleaner for us. Um, Bez, does that seem right to you? Bez has been doing a lot of the work here with us. So we want to defer to him. Including <clears throat> vote extensions in finalized block? In the next block? In the, in the proposal. Proposal. So, in in some kind of, you know, in a way where they are serialized separately from transactions, we can just in process proposal grab the vote extension data that the proposer has included, and then Tendermint can handle yeah. things like ensuring okay. there's greater than two thirds and that kind of thing to catch the common failure cases that we're currently checking, even though they could be caught by Tendermint. Yeah, I mean that would that would be a little nice UX improvement. Mm -hmm. Well, if we if we continue this first on Slack and then we schedule maybe a, a follow up call to, to dive deeper in how we could change that, but it sounds like the yeah. takeaway is that you would not even try to do these changes in zero thirty, correct? That yeah, if, I mean, if okay. it were me, no, yeah. because we just want of like we're using it; it works. In is my sense, um, so we should. Okay. 
we should we yeah. should remove it basically. If I may, if I may, just thirty more seconds because I would like to stress just two things. I would like to like, be registered for anyone watching this. Uh, for this case of uh, the third case, the C, right? Uh, when inserting a trans uh, vote extension, there's nothing preventing a node from inserting a bogus, perfectly signed transact uh, vote extension. So anyone processing that transaction should make sure that it, it is vetted, right? Not just signed. And uh, on, on something else is um, when verifying vote extensions, that process uh, that that has to be deterministic. So for example, what I was reading on the, the script. Um, proposal uh, that was posted for, for the Oracle, right? Um, there, the, in that example that they have posted, they check the value against the their own um, values, the, 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 against its a range based on the value that that node proposed. That's non-deterministic. So it can, it, the, the verified proposal procedure, uh, procedure has to be deterministic. And that's not what was happening uh, in that example that was posted by in this skip uh, website. Uh, but uh, oh, you mean this, in verify vote extension? Yes, because uh, at least in the description, it was saying, okay, maybe this price doesn't fit the range around the value that that node proposed. That's non deterministic. So that was actually a separate Ooh. question. Um, yeah, but, but we, we can you mean, reach out and we can discuss that uh, on, on the Slack if you want. So I think it would be worthwhile to actually have a follow up uh, synchronous conversation yeah. amongst us. Um, definitely worthwhile. Yeah, totally. Um, I think there's um, there's a, a an opportunity to have, and maybe it lives in this knowledge base. Maybe it lives somewhere else. Like very clear, very simple guidelines about, you know, what each of these handlers, the invariance each handler needs to maintain. Because, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, it, it has been very clear that like definitively process proposal needs to be deterministic. And then on verify vote extension, we were talking to some people and some people were like, well, you know, it should be like, you don't like, it is a liveness concern. It's not, but you can do it. I think there should be much more clear answers for application developers if we can. If we can help them, just like you know, yeah. this can be deterministic. Cool. This shouldn't be like that. Would yeah. that would be awesome? We'd really benefit from it, uh, and we're happy to contribute. Cool. You want to continue, Barry? Uh, also on this front, since uh, you suggested it. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, so we. Um, we're, I don't know if this is a tendermint, uh, question or it is actually a straight comment question, or if this actually belongs with the, the SDK, but I'm just going to give the application perspective. Uh, and I know this is something that the UIDX has also been quite concerned about, uh, it is having some testing of network performance overhead that might be incurred by the use of vote extensions. So we see this potentially coming from a couple of different places. One is now our votes that we gossip around are just larger naturally by the size of the bytes. So we might have, a, there might be overhead on the pre-commit phase potentially. It's some proportional in some way to, to that overhead. And then the second one, and this is this kind of cuts into the load extensions not being in the proposal in the API, but actually in practice always having to be in the proposal for the Oracle and, and for the MEV use cases is overhead on the proposal phase, since now we also may have a larger proposal uh, from having to include two thirds plus one stake weighted vote extensions there. Um, so we actually have to put them in the proposal. So again, I, I'm emphasizing this just because it's, it's not done by default, but we have to do it. So there's potentially overhead there as well. And then I know there's been some talk about signature verification overhead in the past. I've compared the network overhead, I think we're much less concerned about that. But one thing I wanted to just understand is whether there are plans as a part of the QA to like test what the overhead on the proposal phase and the commit phase might be. And, in, a, in an actual 
network with a bunch of different code extension sizes. Like in my mind, it's worth it to test it from like a hundred bytes through a megabyte and just let people know. Yeah, I think that Bye. we've been we've been looking for some input on um, how to how to go about the specifics of the QA for the O38 release, and this is good feedback. It is something that that we were thinking about. What would be very useful is to understand, as you said, like the the range of um, of vote extension sizes to test, and also uh, the range of uh, network sizes to test, because there's Right now, our QA in our QA process, we run a 200 node test net. Uh, there was 175 validators in the um, in the QA process. The application that we use is our end-to-end -end testing app, so it's without the SDK. Um, so it's a trivial key value store type application. And uh, yeah, so, so would you say that having a megabyte as the upper limit for vote extension size is reasonable? Do you think that? People are going to use that much data in vote extensions. This is a good One question. Um, I I don't know how big people are going to like people. People will do whatever they can do here. Like vote extensions, they don't have the same proxies as consensus, but they do have this really nice quality of limiting the proposer's freedom to do fuckery, um, <laughs> which is kind of what MEV is all about. So we think about this a lot, and so. Oftentimes, when we're thinking about solving problems, a lot of them are like, well, like, if we throw in vote extension, it gets better by two thirds. Mm -hmm. um, so it would, there's, but there's obviously probably a point where like your net, your network just starts to be degenerate and useless. Um, so I would say yeah. we want to test like up to the point where we're like, guys, this is an unusable network at this point. So similar to the point that I made about wanting to have very clear like page for this is what your handlers can and can't do. It would be it would be good if application developers had that same information about vote extensions, right? Where it's like, hey, once you cross this threshold, like you're going to start to see bad, really bad performance. Um, yes, that makes total sense. And I think that the so the the performance will be impacted by the size of the networks, number of number of validators, and number of, potentially number of nodes in the network. Um, yeah and also the size of the vote extensions. And one of the questions that would come from that uh, for me is, is there like a sane uh, maximum allowable upper limit to a vote extension size? Do we just reject that outright and not even propagate vote extension votes with vote extensions larger than that particular size? Um, but we'd have to do a little bit of work to figure out what that size is relative to the size of the network. So it definitely makes sense to incorporate that into our QA process. I think it would be really valuable as part of the O38 specific QA to do this. So yeah, so we haven't started our QA process yet. And I think that let's follow up on the, um, the potential interface changes. I mean, if there is something that we can do that's, that's uh, low hanging fruit for O38 to change the interface from our previous discussion, um, then we may as well do it now. Um, if not, then we can, you know, but I mean, we'll talk about this in our our follow-up conversation, and then we can start to design the, um, the specifics of the QA process. I don't think it'll be that difficult. We have most of the infrastructure already to be able to do this. I think that the only thing we'd have to do is to um, expand our our testing to be able to configure the size of the the void extensions per test. But otherwise, it's it's relatively um, should be relatively easy to test this. Wondering if it makes sense next to cover this remote center because it sounded like it was also quite small. And then this is more like open ended discussions that could go on uh, beyond what we actually have time. And they might require that we tackle it in the next call as well. So we might as well finish on a clean slate. Because... Sure. We can do that. Um, so I will give a little, little bit of context. Um, so uh, the behavior that we were observing yesterday in the neutron launch was that. The network had, I think it was between 67 and 68% of the voting power online. So it was like right at the threshold of the, the uh, minimum voting power required to be able to make progress. And what happened was the entire network pre-voted and I think everyone except Tokyo managed to send a pre-commit vote. And so the entire network basically locked, was, was stuck at 
uh, height one, round zero, step six for several hours. Now, I don't know what happened exactly, but sometime around uh, 5.45 p.m. Eastern time yesterday, the whole network seemed to get unblocked and then start producing blocks. I haven't actually followed up. I think that the while this call was ongoing, I think that the, the debug session was supposed to be scheduled, but so I, I don't know what the feedback over there is from that debug session, but um, Ethan Barry and I got together on a call um, yesterday afternoon Eastern time to look through some of the logs from Dokio's node. And it was difficult to see for us. Um, it seems as though we may have been missing some information from the logs. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if we were missing information from the logs. It was quite difficult to see what the actual problem was. There were a couple of things that we did notice, though. Um, there were a few timeouts when uh, the the node was attempting to sign votes. Um, I think it was three or four timeouts when uh, the node was attempting to send the votes to the Revel to, um, to sign the, those votes. And we don't know why that happened exactly. So we, we don't have logs for their, um, their private signer. Then um, the other thing is we didn't have the debug logs for, we don't, we don't actually have logging of consensus related information at the info level. So we don't actually have the information to be able to say definitively what happened during consensus the first time around when Dokia didn't actually send the pre-commit vote. So I don't know if we have enough information to be able to draw conclusions from that. One thing that we did take from the um, from the experience was that our you know it's a, it's a recurring insight and theme is that we need to improve our logs. There are many things that we have to do to uh, that we that we can and should do to improve our logs. One of which is probably to add to, to move some of the consensus related uh, logging information from debug to info level by default. And then obviously there's stuff at the P2P layer that needs to be uh, uh, potentially filtered out, removed, or moved to debug level. So I don't know, Barry, if you took anything else from that debug session yesterday that I missed out on. No. Um. No, I mean, I think those were the main things. The only thing I'd add is this behavior of attempting to sign, uh, recognizing that the signature failed for whatever reason. In this case, it was due to a, a timeout with uh, the Horcrux signer. And then moving forward your consensus state anyways to um, to basically, uh, I, in this case, it was pre-commit. So the state at which you, you believe you have already signed feels wrong. Uh, it, it, it's, it is probably avoiding all sorts of problems I'm not thinking about right now, um, but if a signature was attempted and we know it did not succeed, then it, it feels like we should retry that signature would be my very naive uh, takeaway. I, I, yeah, I need to double check what the behavior is over there for if there is a, a failure when it attempts to sign and it can't. But from the logs that we saw, because the logs that we saw basically included um, several replay attempts. So it, it appeared as though the, the node was restarted several times. And so what we observed there was that during the replay, there was a message from the wall where it, it indicated that the node had entered the pre-commit stage, but somehow we didn't also get the log message at debug level that indicated that we got a vote that, that effectively triggered the node entering the pre-commit stage. So now either we're missing the log message or as you say, Barry, some kind of odd behavior is happening over there where the um, somehow we're entering pre-commit but without having actually signed a pre-commit vote. But- Good that, question. Yes. Um, like uh, you just mentioned like starting and stopping nodes. Did Dokia confirm that they started and stopped and stopped nodes in this process? Yeah, so um, 
Uh, Ethan did ask them a couple of times for uh, various different restarts. So the first time he asked them to restart uh, with log level debug. And uh, then I suspect there, that it, the reason why there, I, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, the reason why I was saying that it seems as though the node was restarted was you can actually see the startup logs multiple times where you get the ABCI information and so on. You actually see it gets down to replay where you get that log message where it says replay done. That happened four times in the logs. So it, it looks to me as though the node was started multiple times. So then looking at most of the, the signing failures happened the previous times the node was started, not the last time that the node, node was started. And for the node to catch up, did did uh, did like another node come and complete that like sixty seven percent, or did Dokia like fix the problem and then the blocks proceed? I, I don't know yet. Um, don't have information on that yet. I need to yeah. follow up with the folks to see what actually happened. But it was weird. So you know, Barry and Ethan and I sat for a couple hours yesterday, uh, looking through the logs, looking through the code, and then we looked back at the. I think it was the Explorer and it seemed they were already at like a height 100 or something. And it seemed like it had been produ producing blocks uh, since about 5.45 Eastern time yesterday. Um, still have no idea uh, how it came back online. Maybe, one, uh, yeah. One thing to do in these scenarios is just like ask the user to hit slash consensus state, the RPC. And oh yeah, we did. We also got a okay. also got a dump of that, and we compared that okay, so to another validator's consensus state. Interestingly, that, well, did yeah. it hang at any point? No, it didn't seem like it. Didn't didn't hang. Okay, because sometimes it's like if it hangs, I mean, like like Comet has like this weird startup phases that like RPC and like the the P two P network, the RPC layer. Uh, Prometheus metrics don't start up until like Genesis starts. And so it's just kind of like in this kind of like limbo state, but sometimes that limbo state can like proceed past into like kind of like with the thing that Edmos had, where it's like a um, bunch of nodes entered like this limbo state where it's like they couldn't proceed. They were just like in some sort of deadlock. Um, and so like hearing that they were like starting and stopping their node multiple times, it could have been that they like started and stopped like in the middle of like signing and then came back online and like we're in mm. deadlock and then restarted and then like then got out of the deadlock. Um, but I think like so the starting of networks have like a lot of edge cases. Like I've been in quite a few edge cases in, in this scenario mm -hmm. um, with the launch of networks. And it's like, and like when I was, when I was working on tenement, I tried to like reproduce these like scenarios and like in a controlled environment with like no success. Like yeah. I did like everything what we did in the wild um, and like was unable to like reproduce it. And, and I'm still kind of lost as to like how it happened. Yeah, this is why I think that we need to, why the logging changes are gonna be critical to at least be able to understand these kinds of things in the future. Um, because over here, it just seems to me like we don't have enough information to be able to say definitively what exactly happened, uh, what went wrong, what, what could be changed in the code to make this better, um, apart from the logs, obviously. But um, and I still don't know if it was a, a, like a, a Comet issue. I don't know if it was a Horcrux issue. I don't know if it was, um, uh, as you say, like some kind of weird corner case in, because. It was so odd for me to see that we had almost exactly like 67% voting power online, or it may, may have actually been 68% voting power online. And it was just that one last validator that needed to send its pre-commit vote. Um, and somehow because of that, uh, well, I understand why the network kind of got stuck at that, uh, that stage, but I don't know how it got unstuck either. Um, there's too much information missing right now to be able to say it definitively. Yes, it's good to stop it uh, here and then uh, just sure. give people a few minutes before the. Uh, yeah, we didn't get a chance to go through the last topics. So we'll tackle that in the next call. Uh, if anyone has feedback on how this session went, we went a bit more into protocol design and distributed algorithm design space. That was a bit fun, but uh, I'm also curious if people feel like 
we should stick more to the schedule or time box better or uh, free flow discussion is also fine and pushing things to next calls is also fine uh, so if you have any feedback please uh, let me know on this meeting on slack or anywhere otherwise Thanks, yeah we'll, uh, yeah we'll uh, follow up on slack with the uh, open threads Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.